All right. Well, I think we are live here, and I'm looking forward to another night, another session here uh, for materials. So uh, this is one of those topics that, uh, honestly, I hadn't originally covered in my FE review. This is one that I kind of added on. Um, some people have asked for it, and I figured, you know what, this kind of completes those topics. So if we look at even uh, the major topics, there's there's the different topics. Um, in the NZS spec and actually let me pull that up here just real quick and we can take a look at it um, and we've you know we've gone through this journey and this is kind of the last one in the playlist here um, for our journey and, and what we're gonna do is this this rounds out those topics so there's videos there's problems uh, on the rest of the topics here but let me pull this up if I can and this is uh, this is the uh, NCS spec right we have math stats ethics engineering economics um, uh, you know there's a link to this spec down below so if you want to see it, you can take a look at it um, hey Matt awesome so good to hear from you um, but but you know we've gone through all of these topics except for materials so I said you know what let's just do an extra one just for fun but um, honestly one thing that's been so fun actually has been to get some emails this past couple of weeks of people that have taken the test in the past couple of weeks and say hey Matt, guess what I passed and thanks for your help so um, hopefully uh, this is awesome. So Selena, glad to have you here as well. Uh, hopefully this will this will go well. But this rounds out the topics. Uh, maybe we'll do another session next year. Who knows? We'll see how it goes. But um, but tonight I just want to dive in with materials. And what you'll see with materials is there are you know there's three topics, five to eight questions. And this is one of those things where like honestly mixed design of concrete and asphalt doesn't get covered in a lot of different classes. Um, test methods, we get into some of those, some more than others. Um, but, but metals, concrete, aggregates, yeah, wood, not so much. I mean, I, I was fortunate with where I went to school, we had an agriculture biological engineering program uh, as well, and they actually had a, a whole class on wood design. I was able to take it, and uh, we'll talk through some of the, the those pieces. Um, but then again, physical mechanical properties of metals, concrete, you might be more familiar with those in your typical civil program. Uh, but then when we get to you know asphalt and wood, it's a little bit less so. So we'll we'll get into some of these. I, I it's you know if you've downloaded the problems already, um, hopefully you've been able to work through them. Um, if not, we're just going to dive into kind of each of those topics and take a look to see how we can do. So um, the first couple of questions aren't too crazy. They're kind of concept questions, but I threw these in here to start because as we look at the mix design of concrete and asphalt, one of the things that we have to understand is what the properties of those materials are because. When we get to concrete and asphalt, all that we're doing is we're taking stone and we're putting it together to make a, another material that we can that we can use. So to concrete, what we take stone, we mix it with sand, we make some water and cement to make a paste, and there's you know there's this hydration process that that this chemical reaction that occurs where the the, the cement paste you chemically bonds all those rocks together, and, and that's been happening for thousands of years. Um, nothing too crazy. Similarly, when we get down to asphalt, we take a whole bunch of stone, we mix it together, actually, we mix it together with some essentially, you know, bitumen or tar or asphalt, and we stick it all together. We kind of glue, we, we make these Rice Krispie treats out of stone, essentially, and instead of having marshmallows, because that would be too tasty, um, we actually we put it together with the, the asphalt. So, so really what we're doing is we're trying to take advantage of those and we're mixing them together but to start you know these two these first two questions kind of are go hand in hand um the actually the answers you'll see here the a b c and d are exactly the same for both right but these first two questions kind of go hand in hand the first one says the amount of water specified in a concrete mix is typically based on which of the following conditions for the aggregate right so the aggregate is part of the concrete right what, what what makes up concrete well concrete is made up of what it's made up of uh, you know some coarse aggregate right it, it's made up of some fine aggregates typically this is like a sand um and it's made up, and i feel like i'm spelling this wrong but aggregate um it, it's made up of cement 
and water. And some people will say, well, isn't there air mixed in? Yeah, there's air mixed in, but, but concrete is made up of these different pieces and these aggregates have some capacity to absorb moisture. And, and that's gonna be something that's gonna affect or Im have an impact on the actual performance of the concrete, right? So the concrete itself, that water cement ratio, well, there's another problem further down where we talk, where we dive into water cement ratio a little bit, but that water to cement ratio is gonna have a big impact on workability and durability and strength. So it's gonna have an impact uh, on all those things. So, so, so what we wanna do here is we wanna make sure we get that water cement ratio correct. And when we start looking at this, we're gonna take a look at each of these conditions. So before I jump in and kind of say what the answer is, let's take a look here and see what these conditions are. So, um, so if we have some, you know, some stone here, uh, some, some stone particle, I, I'm just gonna actually take that particle here and I'm gonna duplicate it, okay? And I'm gonna stick it over here, and then I'm gonna duplicate it again, and I'm gonna not stretch it, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I'm just gonna move this thing over here, and then I'm gonna duplicate it one more time, and um, move it over here. And what I wanna do is I just wanna quick kind of define these terms. So if we talk in terms of, let's go to oven dry, um, then we'll do air dry, then we'll take a look at uh, this this magical SSD sat, sur, saturated surface dry, and then we'll look at our last one, which is moist. Okay, and when we take a look at this, I'm going to use a, a blue highlighter here just to kind of take a look at well, what does this look like? Dry. Guess what? I'm not going to highlight anything here because we put it in an oven and we just cooked all the water off. So all the water's gone and the water's cooked off. Well, air dry is when it's been sitting in the sun for, for a certain while. And what happens? Well, the surface of it gets dry, you know, but it's there's still a little bit of water hanging on. If you put it in an oven and cooked it, you'd actually be able to drive some more moisture out. A saturated surface dry is this condition where if I can get this just right, right, what are we gonna have? We're gonna have this thing where we get water basically filling all the pores, those little microscopic pieces and pores of the stone particles, right? But it's not, there's gonna be no extra water. So this is basically like you, you fill up the stone but nothing drips out, right? It, it's just like it gets completely full and nothing drips out. And then the last one here, the moist condition is probably the most common because here we have, well, maybe not the most common, but um, you, you know, typically what, what do you see? We have excess moisture that's sort of hanging onto the outside of the particle, right? So, so these four conditions, I, I wanted to throw these out there because they're, they're conditions that need to be understood. And one of the things that you need to understand when you're looking at concrete design is like, well, how much moisture is in there, right? Because we want to be really, really concerned kind of with this um, water to cement ratio. So we want to make sure we get the right amount of water. So what are we going to do? What we're going to do is we want to make sure that we put the right amount of water in. So we have to have a controlled condition. We have to have a controlled condition in terms of how much water is in the stone already. So we have to know kind of how much the stone can absorb, right? Um, so there's some absorption percent or, or how much that the, the stone can absorb to get the saturated surface dry. And then the excess moisture is going to go into uh, that, that chemical reaction with the cement. Right, so, so we want, when we're designing concrete, we wanna know how much moisture first gets absorbed just by the aggregate. And then second, we wanna provide enough water so that we get full hydration of the cement and we get uh, that full reaction and, and the strongest, you know, the strongest uh, the strongest concrete that we can. And sometimes you don't want like super strong concrete and you might think, well, why don't you want super strong concrete? Well, maybe you want to dig it up later or, you know, whatever. But, but, but here, um, typically when you're designing a concrete mix, you, you start with this, this, um, saturated surface dry condition, and then you add additional water for the cement reaction. Okay. And just a little note here. It's not a cement truck in my, 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 my personal opinion. It's a concrete mixer, right? Because you're mixing concrete, right? It's not a, it's not a flour mixer. It's a bread, you know, it's a bread machine, right? You have a bread machine because you make bread in it, right? Just like a concrete mixer makes concrete. And maybe somebody has a different opinion on that, but um, that, that's my take on it, right? Um, 
you know, the it's <laughs> Rice Krispie treats aren't Rice Krispie treats if they don't have marshmallows. You know, you know, it, 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 so it's so the marshmallows hold it all together. Okay. So hopefully the saturated surface dry condition makes a little bit of sense, but also hopefully it makes a little bit of sense when we come down and start looking at hot mix asphalt. Because what do we want with hot mix asphalt? Well, what we want to do with hot mix asphalt is we want the stone to soak in that asphalt. We want the stone to soak in that, you know, tar, the bitumen, the, the, the stuff that sticks it all together, right? So we want to drive all the moisture out. So if you look up, I mean, you can Google this, there's great videos on how to make hot mix asphalt. But the first thing that you do with hot mix asphalt is you heat the stone up, you heat the aggregate up to drive out all the moisture. Why? So it can absorb that 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 asphalt and and, and really uh, you know bond together so you get a strong a strong asphalt. So with when you're talking about hot mix asphalt here, we want an oven dry condition. We want to drive out all the mo moisture, uh, you know, we because we don't want moisture in that mix. That's going to weaken our mix. So hopefully those, those those couple of questions make a little bit of sense. Uh, but it's just kind of a starting point and kind of like a let's talk about you know, just the conditions of the stone because the stone or the, the kind of the principal, uh, the bulk ingredients that are going to make up whether it's concrete or it's, it's the hot mix asphalt. Okay. So this should, this should work. All right. Any questions on that? I mean, there's a little bit of lag between, uh, you know, what I'm saying and the comments, but, um, if you have any, have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll try to monitor that as I go um, and if everything's just perfectly clear I'm just gonna sit here and keep talking but um, definitely appreciate questions and feedback so uh, let me know uh, or you know drop comments later as you're watching this uh, re the recording okay so what do we have next question three um, variables evaluated for the design of hot mix asphalt include all the following except right and, and again this is kind of like your 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 magic rice krispie mix right you need to have the, the right number of rice krispies you need to have the right number of marshmallows and you need the right you know blend of those right uh, but here uh when we look at when we look at hot mix asphalt what are we doing that first step is we're getting rid of water that's not a that's not a variable that's just a we don't want water we want to get rid of the water and we want to heat up those aggregates to get rid of the water so we get the best uh, bond that we possibly can uh, with the materials. Okay, so again, this these these first kind of questions weren't intended to be like super heavy on the, the calculations, but they were just kind of to throw out there what we want to take a look at. All right, so hopefully they make a little bit of sense. Um, hopefully they, they kind of get you pointed in the right direction. So let's keep going. Question four. Now we get into some numbers and this is, this is kind of interesting. Actually, what I did uh, last week was I actually uh, called up a local batch plant and said, Hey, can you guys just give me a standard 4,000 pound mix? Right? So they actually did that, right? They, they sent me a 4,000 pound mix. I think I have it up here. Is this, is this a, yeah. So here's a 4,000 pound mix. I mean, this is the type of mix design data that you'll get from uh, from a batch plant, right? So the batch plant goes through, they come up with these mixes and um, and then we'll, you know, the, we'll go from there. So there's a certain amount of cement, there's maybe some fly ash in this particular mix. They said, okay, give me one without any fly ash. So they gave me one without fly ash. Um, coarse aggregates, ones and twos, that's a, you know, ones are kind of like your three eighths inch stone, twos are kind of like your three quarter inch stone, um, you know, it, and then fine aggregate, that's kind of like your sand. So, so here, you know, you can see the bulk weight here is really in this aggregate, but then we have a certain amount of cement. Cement on the low end is normally in that five to 550 range. Um, typically if you're looking at like a 4,500 pound mix though, it'll be closer to 600 pounds per cubic yard. And typically the, the concrete's batch per cubic yard. Uh, uh, what else? We have, then we have a certain amount of water here, right? So that, that magic, that magic ratio that we want is that water to cement ratio, right? And we'll, we'll do another problem on those. Uh, and then typically what happens here is, is they, you know, the batch plant will do some tests, right? So here's a water cement curve right, right above me. So, so what you see is as the water cement ratio increases, 
your strength decreases, right? So as the, the water cement ratio here increases, your strength decreases. So Samuel, you asked a question, you think questions are gonna be more conceptual. Yes and no. I, I think there's, I think they could be conceptual. I think the biggest thing, places they can ask you questions on have to do with moisture content of aggregates because those are huge and water cement ratio. So I threw those two in there because I think those are the more, uh, less conceptual and more calculation based type of, of, of questions. So, so what you can see here though, for this, these two, this, this mix is, um, you have a, you have two different curves. You have a seven day curve, a 28 day curve. Um, typically your seven day curve is going to be about 75% of your design value. And you might be thinking, wait, this is a 4,000 pound mix. Why is this 75%? Does that make sense? Like, so, so, so if we look at, if we look at, um, well, let's just play this game for a second. If we look at strength, you know, it, let's just draw a little curve here. So we look at F prime C and we look at time. All right. Typically what's going to happen here is your F prime C is going to start to climb and then it's going to go, you know, over here in, in back in the day, 28 days was picked um, as the design level strength. Will it keep gaining strength? Yeah, a little bit, but, um, but, but as long as moisture is present, it'll, it, it can, can keep, um, keep gaining some strength if that, that chemical reaction is occurring. But somewhere around, you know, seven days, right? seven days, you, you'll get somewhere in the ballpark of about 75% of your strength. So somebody out there saying, okay, that's great, Mark, but, but we're, we're already at about 4,000 pounds. Why are we at 4,000 pounds at seven days when, you know, we have a 4,000 pound mix? You'll see up here, right? This is a 4,000 pound mix. Why are we at 4,000 pounds at seven days? Well, the reason has to do with the, your, your kind of binomial distribution or, or um, your, uh, your normal distribution, right? So your normal distribution says, goes something like this. If you put 4,000 pounds right here at 28 days, that would be bad because half the time you would be less than 4,000. So what do we want to do? We want to move that 4,000, right? We want to move that 4,000 over to, over to some really low value, right? So, so that we know that we're, we're, there's this minuscule little, little, little portion. There's this minuscule portion over here where technically, yeah, you could possibly get, you know, a little bit below. Um, if we're looking at standard deviations, a little bit below, but um, but typically you're not going to get there, right? One out of a hundred type of thing um, where you could get maybe a break that's within 500 pounds of 4,000. But but if you aim high, right? If you set your mean closer to, in this case, this is about, you know, 5,400 here. Sorry, I wrote too many zeros. Um, it, to, you know, you can see your mean is, a, is about 5,400 here, right? If you set it higher, right, then you're gonna, you're going to hit that normal distribution, your standard deviations are still going to get you within uh, the design spec that you want. Does that make a little bit of sense? So, so those are a couple of the concepts that you're thinking of um, when you're looking at a design mix. Um, so, so, so where do we go here? So, so I took this mix, I, I called them up, said, Hey, can I use this? They said, sure, you know, let, go for it. Um, here's just a basic, a basic mix design. Okay. So, I just want to throw that out there for a couple concepts, um, but but here we come back and I, I took those values, I threw them in here, and we have this concrete mix design. This is where I think that you could, they could start asking you some questions, right? And this basically says, here's the mix design. It says the moisture uh, content of the course in fine aggregate is measured as two percent at the batch plant, right? So. Um, so where do we have this? So this is 2% at the batch plan. Uh, and let's look. So, so what, what happens is, well, you have big bulk stockpiles of material of, of stone and sand out there in, in your yard, right? At the batch plant. And what you, what do you do? You go take your shovel fulls, take your buckets and go dry the dry, you know, weigh them, dry it out, figure out your moisture content. Why do you need your moisture content? Because you need to know how much moisture is already in the already in the aggregate and how much you need to add. Because at the end of the day, what you want to do is you want to add this 272. Okay, so you want to add 272 pounds of water, but you, first you have to know how much water is in in the in the aggregate already. So there are really no great formulas in the FE reference handbook. So if you, if you, you know, control F and, and try to find something about, uh, about 
in the concrete mix design, you're not really going to find it in the concrete section. This actually comes up a little bit more right here when we start to look at the water content. Essentially what we're looking at is we have this moisture content or water content um, and, and basically what we're doing here is we're going to say we want to take a look at this water content and see what that is. So ultimately we want to figure out how much um, water we have. So uh, the question is, can I get a PDF of the concrete mix design data? Maybe I'll, I'll insert that into the PDF and repost it online. I, 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 I'm not sure I can hand that out. Um, I, I haven't been given permission to do that, but maybe uh, it will be on the video here so you can take a look at it. And even still, this is kind of the basics of that mix design, right? So it, regardless, you, you can't just take this and run with it because your gravel might be different than my gravel. Your gravel might be different than, or your sand might be different than my sand. Just because it's ASTM C33 or, you know, number 57, it meets that gradation spec, doesn't mean it's going to have the same absorption, right? It's going to have different characteristics. So you have to be careful uh, with reusing stuff like that. So, sorry, I'm, I'm talking a lot here, uh, trying to teach concepts more so than just just straight up solve problems on the test you're just going to go solve the problems but I, i'm trying to get those those big concepts out there for what i think could be tested on on mixed design so so here let's just take a look at the course aggregate let's start with uh the course aggregate and we'll do some calcs right so course aggregate uh so what, what do we know well what we know is the mix the mix requires 1700 pounds of stone at this magical SSD condition. Then I actually talked to the batch plan. I said, hey, where's your stone? Is that SSD or is that oven dry? Because it didn't spec actually on the on the um, and the mix design that they gave me and the the sales guy he's like well i'll pass you on to the batch plant guys because they they're, they're the ones that do the moisture corrections not me so he passed me on and they said yeah the the 1700 is the ssd condition okay so what that means is this 1700 pounds of stone includes this this includes right includes essentially a half a percent of moisture does that make sense because this has a half percent absorption. I asked them for those numbers too. I said, what, what's your absorption? And they gave them to me because they need to know because they have to do these calculations they have to correct, right? So, so the question is, how do we get oven dry, right? So what's the, if this is the, at SSD, right? So actually let me write SSD over here. What's the oven dry condition? Well, th this is essentially gonna equal our 1700 pounds uh, divided by one plus 0.5 percent. Now somebody's going to ask me, well, where'd you get that from, Edson? And, and this kind of is, you'd, you'd kind of have to derive it a little bit from this equation here, your, your moisture content, where you're really looking at the weight of the water divided by the weight of the solids equals this moisture content, right? So we know the moisture content and uh, basically what we're doing is we're kind of adding um, the weight of the water plus the weight of the solids, right? Uh, so, so we get this becomes kind of a hundred plus, you know, one, one hundred, hundred plus the 0.5% because we add the, the weight of the solids on this side as well. If that makes a little bit of sense, uh, it's, but the, but basically what we're doing is we're taking that 1700 divided by one plus 0.5 and, and we can get this value here if we type it into the calculator. One plus one point, what's that? One point zero zero five. You got to be careful with the, the percent. Did I do that right? Yeah, one point zero zero five. It, this is going to equal um, sixteen ninety one point five four uh, pounds, right? Because if we take that sixteen ninety one and we multiply it by one point oh five oh oh five, um, we're going to get back to seventeen hundred. Okay. So this is the oven dry condition. So what does that mean? This means this includes, you know, the, the well, it means our, our, our SSD includes not just half percent of moisture, it includes, what can we say? It includes 1700, right? 1700 minus 1691.54. It includes, what, what, what does that equal? 1700 minus this value is going to give us about 8.46 pounds of, of water. 
Does that make sense? So at Saturated um, Service Dry, we're getting eight, eight pounds of water included, right? But what we know is we're at 2%. We're actually at 2%. So what does that mean? What that means is the weight uh, needed, the weight of aggregate needed at 2% moisture content equals what? Well, it equals the oven dry times the one, um, you know, one plus 2%. Does that make sense? So we're trying to figure out, okay, well, we have the stone. It's not at saturated surface dry. It's not at SSD. How much stone do we actually need to get so we get 1,700 pounds at SSD? Well, we have to multiply it times one point or one plus two. So that's, you know, we take that 1691, we multiply it times 1.02, and we're going to get like 1725.37. So what does that mean? That means that you know when we when we when we scoop up our our you know our, our 1725 pounds as aggregate now now we have now we have 1725.37 minus 1691.54 and that's going to equal how much water we have in addition to just stone. And if we do that out, we're going to get 33. you know, 83 pounds of water. Okay. We know that we are we want 8.46 for the SSD condition. So what does that mean? That means we have an excess of essentially, if we look at it this way, 25.37 pounds um, extra water. To make sorry you can't see it my head's in the way but but basically what we're doing is here here let me just I, I i'm probably talking way too much about this but we wanted an ssd we bring it back to oven dry to figure out well what is just the stone no water right and then we add that water back in to figure out well what does it actually weigh at the two percent and we can figure out the difference kind of between what we need to provide and what we you know what we have in our design mix and the extras water Okay, so we're gonna have to subtract this water from the 272 that's specified. Because when we scoop up our stone, there's more, there's excess water, and that's gonna come back off of this 272. Okay, so the second one I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do this, the fine aggregate. Uh, and this one will be a little bit quicker because I talked about it way too much probably already. But SSD condition, uh, what do we have? We have 1545. So that's 1545 pounds of sand. That's our fine aggregate. Okay, the oven dry condition, we're going to say 1545 pounds divided by our one plus, I think this is what, 1%? Our, our absorption is 1%. Okay, so that's going to be divided by one plus 1%. And when we do that, we're going to get 1545 divided by 1.01. Uh, that's 1529.7 and the the weight needed um, at 2% because this is also 2%. They're both at 2% just magically. Actually, it just made the problem easier. Okay, we're going to take that 1529.7 and we're going to multiply it now times the 1 plus 2% to get the actual weight um, that we would get to get get that we would need here so um what do we have 15 uh the 1529 times 1 1.02 that's going to give a get bring us up to about 1560.3 uh, you know, roughly pounds um, so what does that mean that means we have how much extra water do we have we have essentially this value minus this value. That's going to be our extra water. So this is going to be 1560.3 minus 1545. And that's going to give us, did I do it right? Uh, let's see. It's going to give us an extra 15.3 pounds of extra water, right? So what do we know in the in the coarse aggregate we have 25 pounds of extra water in the fine aggregate we have 15 pounds of extra water. So we're gonna t we're gonna reduce we're, since since we're gonna take our 272 pounds that's required, and we're gonna reduce it by 
that's extra in the course. We're going to reduce it by 15.3 pounds. Um, that's extra water in the fine aggregate. And if we do those numbers out, I think we're going to get one of the numbers up above, but minus 25.4 and minus 15.3. I got about 231 pounds of water. So the idea here is, is what? The idea here is there's too much water in the aggregates. We have to reduce the amount of water we put in because that water's already extra in the aggregate. If you picked up this aggregate and put it on a sieve, that water would start to drip out, right? There's too much water there. It's, it's above uh, SSD condition, the saturated surface dry condition. So the right answer here is going to be this 231. So that's kind of a longish problem, but I, I it, honestly, I try. I, I probably talked way way more about it. Um, I think there's a sample like this in some of the FE sample uh, problems that NCS actually publishes. They do it a little bit differently. They in that question, you can go look it up. Um, they they do a question where they give you instead of SSD weights, they give you oven dry weights. It makes the question a little little bit easier. Um, but I just wanted to go through this, and I wanted to kind of just talk through these these ideas here with oven dry, air dry, SSD and moist conditions because if you have moist look at all that extra water just sitting there around the 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 particles that are, are going to you know detract or, or take away from uh or, or change your water cement ratio you might be thinking like what's the big deal water cement ratio changes a little bit how much does it make a difference here it is it makes a difference you can see this line drops way off really quickly as that little bit of water gets added okay or, or too much water gets added so it does make a difference you can see how the the strength drops off so let's let's take a look at this next question i do this question when i teach a a concrete design class here uh well not here but when i teach a concrete design class i talk about this question a similar question because i want my students to get an idea of when you look at that big concrete truck you know it holds 10 cubic yards of concrete roughly right how much water can actually make a difference because you know you get on site and the slump's a little low and you see the contractor you know saying you know give me a drink give me some water just spray it in there right and you as the inspector as the engineer you're like no 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 i don't want any water right i, I mean if you need a more workable pull, put a super plasticizer and put put something else in that makes the thing more workable right and actually it's, it's kind of cool you even see that in this mix design what you see here in the mix design is you see look what does it say for additional slump request super right the, the super plasticizer is going to give you a, you know an extra if you start out at four inches you add six ounces six ounces that's that's like a small cup of coffee right six ounces of super plasticizer per yard uh, is going to give you an extra inch of slump right and if you do eight ounces that's going to give you a couple inches so it, that makes it more workable without changing the water cement ratio which is one of those key parameters right so that's something to think about too but um how much water is too much water let's let's take a look at this okay so we have a concrete mix design that requires 593 pounds of cement per cubic yard uh, with a maximum water cement ratio of 0 0.45 0 0.45 is a pretty typical number um, portland cement is the only cementitious material in the mix sometimes you can get like a fly ash or a silica fume or you know other uh, supplementary cementitious uh materials in there um you know slag or, or other pozzolans but but for this mix we're just using just using uh, portland cement and what do we have if a 10 cubic yard truck arrives on site with a batch and getting 310 gallons of water we're already included in the batch right so we know 593 pounds of cement we have a 0.45 water cement ratio we have 310 gallons of water Okay, let's let's work this out. The number of gallons required to make the water cement ratio exceed the specification is most nearly. So zero, the water cement ratio already exceeds 0.45. Hopefully not. If, if it shows up at the site like that, you just throw it off the site and say, no, it, it's rejected. It doesn't work. Um, what do we have? We got five gallons, 10 gallons, or 15 gallons. And what I want you to see here is it's not a lot of water. I mean, you get that big old concrete mixer and you got a five gallon bucket, is it really gonna make a difference? Two five gallon buckets, I mean, is it really gonna make a difference? And what I wanna show you is that it can, it certainly can. So let's let's take a look at that. Um, but let's just define water cement ratio. Water cement ratio is literally just um, the weight of the water um, divided by the weight of the cement, 
right? And I'll put in parentheses here or SCMs, right? Supplementary cementitious materials. So like SCMs, uh, these are the supplementary, actually, let me just write it out, supplementary um, cementitious uh, materials. And again, that could be like slag, it could be fly ash, it could be silica fume, um, you know, some pozzolans, different things like that, that are often waste products from another, you know, another industry that you can bring in and actually use that'll enhance uh, the cementitious properties of the, uh, of the mix. Um, which is good. I, I mean, if we can, if we can do that, and we can reuse those materials and get the properties we want, this is this is a good thing. So let's first kind of figure out. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So if we have five, you know, let's 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 figure out our weight of water. Okay, what was already added? Weight of water, right? What was already added? Well, we know we have three hundred and ten gallons. And don't you hate this? We need weight. We don't need gallon. So one of the things I did here is I just wanted to show you something. If I search gallon, there's some million gallons per day. We'll go to environmental. But look at this. One of the first things that come up here is we have a one gallon of water weight. I don't know if you can see that wonderfully well, but one gallon of water weighs 8.3. I'll get my head out of the way. 8.34 pounds of force. Okay, so this is cool. Um, we used our reference handbook for something, but what do we have? Eight, 310 gallons times 8.34 pounds per gallon. Okay, and so that's gonna give us, and actually let me put this, this is per the whole truck. And so how much, how much is that? It's 310 times 8.34, and that's gonna be 25, my, my screen skipped here, 25, 85.4 uh, pounds. Okay, so 25, 85.4 pounds. Uh, that's what's in the whole truck. You know, that's that's per truck. That was already added that at the bash plant. Okay, well, let's look at the weight of uh, the cement. And this is nice because we're told we have 593 pounds uh, per yard but what we know is we have 10 yards per truck right so we just this, this is just 59 30 I'm sorry yeah 59 30 uh, pounds per truck okay so what's our water cement ratio well literally we just get to divide these two so our, our current water cement ratio is 2585 uh, 0.4 divided by 59.30 and you can see all the units actually cancel out right um, so so th these units the pounds per truck and the pounds per truck they cancel out so this is good and we can calculate our current water cement ratio so 2585.4 divided by 59.30 is going to be 0.436 okay so 0. 436. So the good news is we're below or you know we're below what was specified. So so we know that we can kind of cross this one out. But how many gallons is actually going to make a difference? And that's where we get to try to figure this out. Okay, so if we want to get, you know, let's let's think of it this way. To get um, to get to 0 0.45 how much water is needed well what we can do is we can take we can take essentially our 59 30 pounds of cement per truck right we can multiply it by our 0 0.45 water cement ratio so now we're just gonna solve for the water right I mean I could have done this to start uh, but what do we get we get two six six eight point five pounds of uh, you know of water per truck right the pounds of water per truck um, and what we see here is this number is bigger than this number right so so the amount that we can had add and get 0.45 is bigger than what we've actually added already how much bigger is it well it's bigger you know so we we can add add up to Right, what are we adding up to? 2668.5 pounds minus 2585.4 pounds. So we can add 
up to the this is the you know we can add up to this maximum amount or at and we're still at 0.4 or 5 minus what we've already added so what is that well if i if i do the math correctly 2668.5 and subtract off our 2585.4 i'm going to get about 83 pounds of water 83.1 pounds of water so you can add 80 pounds of water to this big old truck that is kind of massive and how many you know our answer up here is in gallons so we need to take that back to gallons and what i'm going to do i'm going to multiply this by um, 8.34 pounds per gallon and what do you see we get 83.1 divided by 8.34 and i got like 9.96 uh 9.96 gallons okay so what does that mean that means if we come back up here if we add 10 gallons of water right if we add i mean even five gallons of water is going to impact that uh water cement ratio but a lot of times oftentimes there will be some water held back at the plant and then if you need to add a little bit to increase workability you can you can add it you can't really take it away too easily um, sometimes people instead of taking water away they'll throw another bag of cement in the in the truck right they'll try to play with it that way but here what we can do is we can add uh we can add some of this you know we can add water but not a lot of water right i mean in that whole 10 yard truck 10 gallons i mean like that they will will definitely have an impact on the water cement ratio i'm um, depending on how much is held back at the batch plant but if you're you know if you're adding more than five gallons i, I i'd be really really nervous uh on site to do that because all of a sudden you start getting low breaks you start getting jackhammer and concrete and everybody gets mad because that it, that costs a lot of money to do okay but in terms of uh, concrete design mix, I think I think FE could ask you about water cement ratios. I think they could ask you about aggregate conditions, moisture content. Uh, that kind of gets back into even the, the geotech piece as well. All right. So let's keep moving. I mean, let's keep moving. And here we're going to go to test methods. And this is one of those test methods. I think everybody did at some point when you're taking a statics and strength of materials or mechanics of materials or mechanic, you know, mechanics of deformable body or whatever you call it, right? Somebody at some point probably had you do this test or at least looked at this test uh, and came up with a curve like this to, you know, did a test um, that, that uh, allowed you to see this curve and what did that test look like typically there was some big loading apparatus right and what did that what did that do um in that loading apparatus you put some little piece in here that looked like a dog bone or you know a test coupon and then what happened uh you just pulled this thing apart and you just pulled it apart and you measured how much force it took in the elongation and then typically you went back and you know you were required to do some sort of stress strain curve right so typically this is done in most most kind of mechanics and materials courses I, I had to do it when i was taking uh that course back in the day uh i have my students actually do a, a video with some of it as well and we stop and we pause and we look at it and look at some of the different pieces but basically you take that piece you pull it until it breaks and do you remember what happens at some point it starts to neck down and get really small but what's this called well this is you're pulling this thing in tension so this is actually this is a tensile test um this is this is a typical test that's done it's one of those things um ductility and marshall they, they can actually get into the asphalt kind of test where you can start looking at some of those um sharpie impact is another one where you remember that one you take the hammer i think and you you, you, you um, impact it you know you drive through it um but there's some different types of, uh, of tests here that uh you may have experienced uh, as a as a you know mechanics materials or uh, material science course even but this is the one of those basic tests the tensile test and we're going to come back to this diagram kind of over and over again even then or through the next few problems but wanted to throw that one out there just to get started and keep going okay we'll come back to that and here actually we have results of multiple tensile tests so not everyone looks like that um here we have uh you know some tensile tests that look kind of like this right so we got four different tensile tests and this is one of those kind of like alternate 
exam type questions, make it maybe a drag and drop. Uh, I was told by one student recently that took the test, said, hey, Mattson, you didn't do any fill in the blank. That kind of took me off guard. And yes, FE can do fill in the blank questions as well. So they can like on this last question, I almost changed this, not this last, I almost changed this question to a fill in the blank. The minimum number of full gallons that you can add to impact, you know, the, the uh, water cement ratio is and just blank and you have to put in 10 and anything other than 10 is wrong right so there are potentially fill in the blank there are some drag and drop there are click on diagram type of thing uh, but let's take a look at this. The approximate stress strain curves for various materials are shown in the figures below and match material type and loading condition with the appropriate diagram. So what do we have? Well, this first diagram looks a lot like what we just looked at in the previous, the previous problem, right? We have this kind of straight portion and this flat portion and this rise and then the fall and then nothing else. And what does the nothing else mean? It means it failed, right? It actually broke. It can't take any more load. So, uh, anybody have any thoughts on what this one is? I mean, maybe you can put it in the chat. But uh, ah, this was that one that we just looked at, and I didn't. I tried not to give it away before, but I'm waiting. I'm hoping somebody will put it in. But if not, I mean, maybe I could even do a poll here. I mean, good grief! I haven't done any YouTube polls yet, but maybe, maybe, maybe. What do you think? What? Eh, whatever. Actually, I'm not going to do a poll. It'll take too long. So nobody's answering. So I'm just going to throw it out there. This one is steel and tension, right? When you pull on steel, you get that first linear elastic portion, and then you get this plastic plateau. You get some strain hardening, and then you get some uh, necking and failure. Okay, so this one is going to, if, if I had set this up right, I would have been able to drag this over. I screwed it up, um, so I didn't. So we'll just write it in steel in tension. Okay, one done. So what does that mean? It means let's look at the next one, which, you know, so we've, we've, we've effectively got this one already. Okay. What's, what else is left? Well, we've got three left. We've got, uh, we've got stress strain. We've got stress strain. We've got stress strain. So what you see here is this, this material, this is another one of those questions uh, where I'm just going to take this one question and throw another question at you. And, and verbally, I'm just going to say, which one of these materials, right? This material, this material, this material, this material, which one of these materials exhibits ductile behavior? Maybe you can click on the ductile ones, right? Which one of these materials exhibits brittle behavior? Do you know the difference between ductile, ductile and brittle? I had a great uh, concrete professor. Uh, shout out to Professor Hover. I mean, he he actually went on to be um, the president of ACI. So I I, I learned from somebody um, who who is in it to win it. But he he loved concrete. I mean, he he came in trying to illustrate brittle and ductile, and he would throw Twizzlers at us for 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 ductile because they're stretchy and Kit Kat because you know they, they break give me a break all right but the the brittleness of, of Kit Kats they just break they snap and that's this is this is here this is a brittle a brittle material where you have this this it, it, it you have this linear portion of that stress strain curve it's sort of like Hooke's law you add force you get deformation add more force get more deformation right until a point it just snaps right in which one's this where what you know of the materials we could have concrete intention, but concrete compression doesn't doesn't just isn't brittle like this is brittle. It doesn't just snap. It actually you start to get micro cracks. So this one you start getting micro cracks. Um, here, this next one you start getting some the concrete you start getting micro cracks and it starts to to taper off, taper off, taper off, and then ultimately fail at a failure strain of about 0 .03, 0.04, depending on uh, the strength. But here, wood is actually fairly, if we're, lo if we're loading wood in intention, parallel to the grain, wood is actually a fairly brittle material. Um, if you're pulling on it in intention. Wood has a stress strain curve like this. Maybe you'll get um, 10,000 KSI out of it. Uh, but this, this, this one down here is gonna be wood, um, in tension. I'm just, this is parallel to the grain, but it's wood in tension. 
And this one, yeah, Selena, this one up here is going to be our concrete where as you start your, you know, a lot of times with concrete, you get these cylinders and you're, you're loading your concrete cylinders, right? And, and what happens is as you load it, you start to get these little itty bitty cracks in it. And as you get these little cracks in it, it's the, your, your, your modulus starts to, you, you, the material starts to become less stiff. So you start to decrease, decrease, decrease. And another thing that they could throw out at you here is a, a, a typical strain for your maximum strain uh, um, is going to be about 0 0.002, but then your, your strain at failure is going to be 0 0.003. That number 0 0.003, I don't know if that shows up in the handbook, but it's all over the ACI code and it shows up in there for sure. That's a failure strain of concrete. This is um, actually, let's just, I'm curious now if we come back to civil engineering and I, um, let's just take a look here at our, at our reference handbook for a second and come down to concrete. I'm curious if they give you, I don't remember, honestly. Um, and so I'll, I'll go on this journey with you. Let's go to concrete in here and we have unified design provisions. We have concrete and do we have an ultimate strain? We kind of do here. We have the 0 .003 that shows up. Uh, let me just come back and look. Design and reinforce concrete structures. I don't think it calls out specifically that this 0 .003 is your ultimate concrete strain, but that's what it is. Okay, that 0 .003 is that, that maximum strain at failure. Okay, and that's what the ACI code has. I think there's some Euro codes and some other codes that don't use 0 .003, but in ACI 318, that 0 .003 shows up here. It, this isn't called the, the the ultimate stream, but that's what it is if you are familiar with concrete. So if it is in there, I don't know, let me know, but this, this is going to be, you know, this one here, um, this one up here, sorry, this one up here is going to be concrete in compression all right so what does that leave we have wood um wood in compression and hopefully um if you didn't know what wood in compression looked like it's going to look like this but wood is kind of similar to concrete in some ways because as you push on the wood you start to get those little fibers that buckle a little bit or you know and you start to get little little reductions in stiffness until eventually you get you know a failure at some point I threw some values in here, um, stress for concrete, typically you're in that four to 6,000 pound range, or I'm sorry, four to, four to six, if we have four to 6,000 PSI, four to six KSI. Um, for steel, a lot of times you'll be at 36 KSI uh, for your typical steel. Sometimes you go up to 50, depending on what steel you're using. Um, wood intention, maybe around 10, uh, wood in, in compression about four. So. Are these numbers perfect? No, they're not perfect. Do they show up uh, in the reference handbook? They kind of do to a certain degree. If we come back to mechanics and materials, I think it's in mechanics and materials uh, where we have some basic tables down here. Is it is it mechanics and materials? We do have some of this here where we have modulus elasticity. This doesn't give you the, those yield strengths, though. It just gives you modulus of, of elasticity. So. It's not perfect. Um, it gives you some things, but I, I wanted to throw that out there just to, again to talk about these stress strain curves, to talk about ductile versus brittle, uh, and kind of get some of those term those terms out there because uh, that's where I, I think they could ask you some of the concept questions as well. Steel very ductile, very ductile it, it, uh, material. It, it's great because you can see there's this long there's this long 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 uh, amount of deformation, a lot of deformation before the thing fails. Um, you know, wood intention, concrete, less so. They're, they're a lot more brittle. These aren't to scale. Um, I mean, this, you know, if, we were, if we're looking at a scale here, we're probably at like 0 0.002 for steel um, down here strain. And, you know, over here, it's like 0 0.2. I mean, like the, the, it just, it, it's orders of magnitude different between if you're looking at like 0.2 versus 0.003. There's a lot more room for permanent deformation and before you fail the thing versus concrete or wood intention. All right. So again, this is a, you know, if we label, we have ductile, a lot of deformation before failure, a brittle, uh, it's, this is like a purely a pure brittle material where like there's no I mean, there's deformation, but there's, um, there's no plastic deformation, right? There's no permanent deformation. The thing just goes and goes and goes and then all of a sudden snaps. Okay. So, so those are just a couple terms that I wanted to throw out there as well. 
So if, if you have questions, feel free to put them in chat and I'll do my best to respond. Wait, didn't we do this question already? No, we didn't do this question already. This is one of those questions where, again, it's just a terminology thing. If you haven't looked at a stress drain curve in a while, I'd say go look at one because I think this is one of those fundamental concepts. Stress drain curves are, are one of those, those kind of fundamental concepts that I think could definitely show up. So this is where, do you know what the ultimate tensile strength is? Right, I mean, this could be one of those questions where they say, click on the ultimate tensile strength, right? So where do you click? Well, do you click here? 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 There are a couple of good guesses. If you look at these numbers down here, you, you get 47.5, where's 47.5? 47.5 is kind of this little dip. Uh, where's 50? 50 is kind of like this point. Uh, where's 52? If we come all the way over here, we're at 52. And if we're up here, we're probably at 78.5. So the question is, which one's the ultimate tensile strength? And I threw this in here again because I think this is super important. I think you need to know what ultimate tensile strength is. I think you need to know what yield strength is. Uh, I think you need to know, you know what some of these materials are that are gonna help you. So it, I'm just gonna dance around here for a second, but this value is your yield strength. What does that mean? It means once you get past that point, you get permanent deformation. So if you think about like a paper clip, for example, you know, nothing too crazy, but a paper clip, right? At some point, I can, I can, I can pull this thing out and there's no permanent deformation there, right? It snaps back. But at some point, what's going to happen? Ah, I go past the yield point and there's permanent deformation. So I stress this thing past its yield point, right? And the interesting thing about paper clips, is is oftentimes you know when you do this and stretch it out like this it, I'd like you maybe you can pick a paper clip up at home but you, you stretch it out and then if you if you've ever tried to bend a paper clip back to its original shape do you see what happened there I don't know if you can see it but this has like a little flat section to it it doesn't want to go back to its original shape it actually it's really hard and actually almost impossible to go back to its original shape you know why because of strain hardening, right? Because actually once I get past this plastic deformation, this thing actually starts gaining strength again. So what happened is I start, I got to this point and this, this section strain hardened. So what's going to happen next? Well, what happens is the parts that aren't strain hardened want to bend first. So when I try to bend this thing back, these parts are harder. It'll bend the softer, you know, less stiff materials uh, first. It'll permanently deform the other materials first before it gets back to um, making this piece straight, if that makes a little bit of sense. So we have FY. We have, well, what's this going to be? This is going to be our FU, our ultimate tensile strength up here. And we, you know, this will typically be like a rupture strength. This is like FR, okay, like a rupture strength. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want to throw out here is just, uh, again, just some terms. I mean, this, uh, this goes beyond beyond just like um, beyond what the question asks but I'm, I want to throw this stuff out there so you can kind of hopefully get more the, out of this question than just just the basics okay uh, is that good I don't know I feel like I'm not getting that right where I want it let me just redraw it here um, if I redraw this here I'm gonna start right ah this isn't working so let me oh that's not what I wanted either Good grief. Well, let me um, rotate page clockwise. Sorry, I don't know how I did that one. Um, but I managed to do it somehow. Okay, so let me take a look at this and try to get this this line drawn a little bit better. I'm just gonna use my mouse. That's gonna work a little bit better. Okay, so I wanna draw some, some lines in here to try to illustrate a couple of their concepts uh, just that I think are important with this curve in some different areas in here. So this first area, right, this first area of the curve, right, this first area here, this is going to be, do you know what it's called? This is our, um, this is kind of our elastic, our linear elastic portion. So up until that yield point, it's elastic. It's like a rubber band. You stretch it out, it comes back to the same shape, right? It's like that, it's like the uh, paper clip before I permanently deformed it. I stretched it, it came right back to, to where I wanted it, okay? And, and then we have this, this, uh, this section here that's plastic. In, in other words, you don't have to, 
add any more force and it will permanently deform right and if you came back down you you'd follow you you know you'd come back down um, but there would be the permanent deformation in there plastic I, I like to think of plastic as as kind of permanent deformation okay and then um, this section in here is what we're gonna call the strain hardening section hardening I think I'm spelling that right I don't know um, this is the, that part where you actually gain some strength and then we're gonna eventually get to a failure or a rupture and if you've ever done a, one of those stress strain tensile tests, um, this is kind of where necking occurs, right? And no, I'm not talking about kissing. This is the, the part where the, the material starts to get smaller until it finally uh, ruptures, okay? So this is just, you know, this is, uh, these are some of those definitions, but again, with those multiple uh, or alternative question types, they could say, click on the yield strength, right? And you can click on here, click on the ultimate strength, you click here, you click on the rupture strength, you click here, click in an area where there's strain hardening, you know, you can click here, click in an elastic area, click here. So again, this is one of those ones that's ripe for questions. You just have to know kind of how to navigate it and what some of those terms mean, okay? And then we keep going, and guess what? It's the same question. No, it's not the same question. What, what do we do now? Plot showing stress strain is provided below. The modulus of elasticity of this material is most nearly. What's modulus of elasticity? That is this, this slope of this curve, right? That's the slope of this curve. That's our modulus of elasticity. That is, uh, you know, E, if we think about it like this, E, the modulus of elasticity, equals what stress over strain so literally this is just the, the the slope of the linear elastic you know portion of the curve right so where's that linear elastic portion it's right here right so we got that linear elastic portion i'm just going to highlight that um, nothing special here, but I'm going to highlight that. Eh, that didn't really show up that wonderfully, but that's our linear elastic portion of the curve. I'm going to just zoom way in there for a second. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw a couple lines as well. So if I, if I have a couple lines, um, one of the things that I notice actually before I even draw my lines, let me, let me highlight this. Look at this point right there. That's a great point. If you, if you ever need to find a slope of a line, um, what do you do? The first thing you do is you look for where there's a obvious point of intersection right so I can now come come down here and I can draw in a couple lines but what I see is this is an obvious point of intersection here and I can um, use those points essentially for my rise over run so if I start at zero right if I start at zero zero which zero force zero strain makes sense um, we're gonna come up to you know up to 30,000 and over to if this is point zero zero one or you know, 0 0.01 this point here is going to be 0 .0 0.001 yeah add an extra zero in there right so I'll zoom back out a little bit here but what does that mean um, our slope is going to be essentially our, our change in stress over our change in strain which is going to equal 30,000 uh, PSI divided by 0 0.001 and that's going to give us 30 million uh, PSI for our modulus of elasticity, which fortunately is an answer for us and uh, it, it is also representative of steel. Steel would actually be closer to 29 million, but you know this 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 worked out pretty well. It's pretty close. If if I had a better graph, maybe it would be exactly 29 million, but um, you know, it, it works. And actually, if you come back to our, oops, wrong thing, sorry, wrong button there. But if we come back to our stress strain curve, or our material properties, we have steel, right? What's this 29 million PSI, right? That's, that's, that's a typical um, curve for, for, for steel. Also, if we look at our mechanics and materials section, we have this basic relationship. We have to have a stress strain relationship in here somewhere. I mean, we have a stress strain curve in here even, right? So maybe I could have put this in the me uh, mechanics and materials section, but I think it fits really nicely in the materials section 
as well. And let me just look. I, I know that stress drain curve formula has to be in here. Uh, it, it has to be somewhere. Where is it? Where E is the modulus of elasticity. Uh, with stress equals force over area, strain equals delta over L. Here we go. Um, your modulus elasticity is stress over strain. So same type of thing um, that we just did here to find the slope of that curve. But you might not be given stress and strain, you might be given a curve and you gotta do the same type of thing. So I, I threw this, this, this uh, diagram on there three different times because I think it's important. I think it's actually four times. I, I think it's one of those things where it's, it's kind of fundamental and um, one of those ones that if you know how to do or understand pretty well, you should be, you should be able to get a couple points with. All right. So no questions, we'll keep going and let's go here. Okay, select the material that exhibits approximate linear elastic behavior. Oops, let's get it to focus again here. Select material that exhibits approximate linear elastic behavior to the points indicated. Okay, so again, another alternative question type. I'm throwing these out there quite a bit tonight just because there's some concept questions, but which ones uh, linear elastic, right? What's linear elastic? Linear elastic are those be are those are those that are have that straight line, right? So you or the rubber, you pull it out, it comes back, okay? Um, whereas permanent deformation is no longer elastic that, that gets into plastic behavior so we know with steel steel is kind of easy we just did this steel up to its yield strength we're happy with steel up to its ultimate tensile strength uh-uh right no that's not going to work because if we can't if we come back to our diagram what do we see this is not linear elastic this is not linear elastic behavior that's not linear elastic okay so we, we can see that that's uh, that's kind of that's good. So what does that mean? To its failure strength, uh-uh, right? Failure strength, no, I, I use that five, you can use FR. It, sometimes it depends on who's writing it, but um, steel, okay, steel we're good on. What about concrete? Well, concrete, um, we said earlier, is gonna look something, you know, something like this, where we have some curve that kind of looks like that. And this is gonna be like your F prime, or, or F prime C is gonna be, you know, this value up here. And on this side, we're going to have our strain. Actually, let me extend this a little bit. Um, we're going to have our strain. And this value right here is going to be about 0 0.003 for concrete. Uh, and typically, if we're looking at up to about 50% here, 50% of F prime C, we're pretty close to linear elastic. Okay, and after that, you, you can see that this, I didn't draw it perfectly, but you can see that we start to, you know, veer away from that, that straight portion. So the micro cracking in that concrete isn't going, going to be too crazy, up to about 50% of F prime C. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy with this one. Okay. The concrete up to its maximum compressive strength. So, so no, so its maximum compressive strength you know, is, is this point, this is that F prime C and, and we're not going to get a straight line up to, up to that point, right? If we draw a straight line or I take a straight line, you know, from this point all the way up, we, we don't go, you know, we don't go straight there. We have to come kind of, you know, through a curve and that's, so this one's not going to work. And you might be thinking, okay, this question's done. We're, we're done, right? because I, I know that also if I look at this, I'm not gonna have, a, that's, that doesn't make sense either, okay? Up to its ultimate compressive strain, that's epsilon CU, um, right? This is that epsilon CU value here, epsilon CU, the ultimate co um, concrete compressive strain. Okay, so we've, we've eliminated these, um, and, and somebody wants to just uh, concrete up to its modulus of rupture. But, but stop for a second, what's the modulus of rupture? In concrete, if we put concrete in tension, this is the modulus of rupture, right? If we put concrete in tension and kind of go the other way, so if this is our compression curve, if we go the other way, do you know what happens with, with concrete in tension? It essentially is a very brittle material and if, if this is, you know, we have one side that's in compression, the other side's in tension. Actually, if this is like, if we call this value down here FR, the modulus of rupture, this section in tension is actually fairly linear elastic as well. 
So normally we don't talk about tensile strength too much in concrete. We just ignore it and put rebar there. Okay, but the up to the tensile strength of the concrete is typically pretty linear elastic, but it's also very brittle. So we don't like to, to count on uh, count on that, that concrete strength and tension, but it is linear elastic. Okay. So another one of those kind of alternative question types, but I threw it in there to, again to get you thinking a little bit about some of these these pieces and uh, you know concepts. So we'll keep going unless you have questions. If you have questions and I go past something, let me know. I had somebody in one of the sessions say, "Matson, you you did sine and cosine wrong." Like way at the end of the class, I'm like, "Oh man, I did the sine. I, I wrote down the sign right, but like I just I screwed it up. I was I think I was too tired." But you know, let's keep going here. Here we'll talk about steel reinforcement. Why is steel t reinforcement typically added to concrete flexural members? It, for all the reasons except, okay, we're still just talking about physical and mechanical properties of metals, concrete, aggregates, asphalt, wood. So why is steel reinforcement added to concrete? Because steel is ductile. It, it's great in tension. We want to use the steel to take that tension, right? Concrete is not so good in tension, right? Concrete is pretty brittle in tension. So we add it most of the time just to take that, that, that tensile force wherever there's tensile forces in concrete. So what does that look like? Yeah, it, it, we, we like this to resist, we like steel to resist tensile forces, right? Due to bending moment, right? Because typically uh, if, if we're looking at that concrete, we're gonna have tension on one side, compression on the other. That makes sense. Okay, um, to allow for increased ductility, right? We don't want concrete be beams loaded, 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 all of a sudden fail. We don't like that. We, we've seen bridges fail like that when it's just a catastrophe, when it's all of a sudden a failure. We don't like that. What we want is ductility. Why do we want ductility? Because we wanna be able to see what's gonna happen. We wanna be able to see that it's gonna fail before it fails. It's a lot safer that way, right? You want to see that big amount of permanent deformation before the thing actually just gives out. Okay, so yes, adding steel does um, increase ductility. It, it increases ductility. Okay, uh, do steel and concrete have similar coefficients of thermal co co expansion? Yes, they do. So when you you know freeze and and, and thaw this thing. Yes, it's going to, those two are going to act together. Um, are we ever going to eliminate, eliminate tension, tension cracking? No, we expect tension cracking, okay? So one of these things isn't the same. One of these things doesn't belong, right? This one is actually the correct answer because we have to deal with that except, okay? So the one that does not work is we're not putting steel in there to eliminate tension cracking. We're actually putting steel in there to engage when the concrete cracks. We expect the concrete to crack and the steel's gonna take that, okay? The steel's gonna take the tension that comes as a result. All right, so hopefully that works. Not too crazy, but again, some of those concepts I wanna throw out there because again, there aren't a ton of calculations, but here's one, here's one. Uh, the modulus elasticity of normal concrete with compressive strength of 4,000 PSI uh, would, you know, consistent with ACI 318 requirements is most nearly, what is that? Let's come back here and take a look at our, our reference handbook. And if we come back to civil engineering and come down to uh, the concrete section, we see that there's some definitions here and this is, I mean, you could, you could search this. I, I just know it's kind of in here, uh, but we see there's an equation here for a modulus of a elasticity. You could search and find modulus of elasticity. It's not the only one that'll come up, but this is an equation that's given. So EC modulus of elasticity, 33 weighted concrete to 1.5 times the square root of F prime C. I, I want to, before I, before I leave here, I want to throw out a couple other things. What do we see? We see that uh, F prime C is the compressive strength of the concrete in PSI. What's WC, right? Where's WC? Where's WC? It doesn't show up in here. Does it show up somewhere else? Maybe it does. I don't know. Let's search and, and see what WC is. Does that show up anywhere? Oh man, and this is where like if you don't know what that is on the test, you're gonna waste time, right? WC, and you, you then now you search WC, and you see okay, WC it probably has to do with what normal weight concrete. Okay, that's great, but if you don't know what normal weight concrete is, what what do you do next? 
ah, we just we, we panic right hopefully on the test you're not panicking uh, hopefully on the test it, it's not gonna be too crazy but what do we see is there a WC on this page Uh oh um, that's the water content or what's WC on this page this is a geotech page is this or is this just back to the beginning I don't even see WC there uh, but we're back to the beginning and that's where I don't know if if you have a question like this if they will give you WC or they just expect you to know WC I also don't know um, let me come back to my materials section here first or mechanics and materials section for a second actually I'm just gonna come this way and I'm gonna look to see do they give you concrete over here I don't see concrete over here I was wondering if they were gonna give me a density uh, and I don't see it you know so I don't know I, I don't know if, if you have this type of question if they're gonna give you WC or not but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna I, I'll tell you what it is and maybe they'll give it to you maybe they won't I, I'm not sure uh, honestly this is one of those numbers if you know it maybe you can put it in the chat box but the number that I get here Actually, let me just write down the formula first and maybe somebody will put it in there. But EC equals 33 times WC to the 1.5 times the square root of F prime C. Okay, so this becomes kind of a plug and chug game, but 33 times WC, I'm gonna leave that blank for just a second, to times the square root of F prime C. And yeah, if to remember, actually, if you look back in the reference handbook, we have F prime C at 4,000 PSI okay and what do we get here ah man what's that WC if you don't remember uh, it's it's typically for concrete is around you know the norm for normal weight concrete the gamma is, or, or the unit weight is around 145 pounds it, it's one it's sometimes a little bit less 143 144 145 those are all typical numbers uh, I think we could use we could use 145 in here and we're gonna get something close but but what we do if we do that we do 33 times 145 to the 1.5 uh, times the square root of 4,000 um, I'm gonna get like three six four uh, four thousand roughly I mean it's 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 uh there's a lot of zeros in there I don't know there's a lot of zeros so that's gonna be in PSI okay so it if you know the way to concrete it's great if you don't um, it makes it harder to do <laughs> but I, again I don't know maybe they'll give you the way to concrete maybe they won't um, the, another number that I'm just gonna throw out there is a lot of times you'll see you look at reinforced uh, concrete this might be another number that you're familiar with 150 pounds per cubic foot and I probably should have put per cubic foot here as well per cubic foot reinforced concretes typically a little bit more dense why because you get that that seals a lot more dense than concrete is and you get that little bit of steel but it, it increases the unit weight okay um, so reinforced concrete typically a value of 150 is used if you t if you strip that that steel out, it's typically down closer to 144, 145. Okay, um, so I think if you use 150, you might get closer to this 3.8. Okay, but I threw that one in there just for fun. And we only got a couple questions left, and then we're done for the night. But what do we have? We have physical and mechanical properties again. Which of the following material properties can typically uh, be used to describe wood? Okay, so you might not have had a wood uh, a wood class or a wood design course, but hopefully you know you, you know en enough about the English language to know that incombustible is not something we associate with wood. Why? Because wood can burn. Wood is combustible, right? So it's not incombustible, if that makes sense. Um, wood is 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 a combustible. Um, we don't we don't use incombustible to describe wood unless it's like a fire treated wood so so this one is not so good it's, it's not incombustible it's not impermeable what does permeable mean it permeable means it can soak in water wood is permeable it's not impermeable and there's way too many knots going on here okay and I wasn't even trying to make a pun with woods and knots but um, maybe it threw it out there so <laughs> so these last two 
isotropic and orthotropic. Do you know what those terms are? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but I, I wanted to throw them in because I think it's it's useful to help describe wood. When we think of wood, right, let me just draw a little cross section of a piece of wood here, right? When we When we look at wood, right, what do we know? Well, typically we have uh, some some grain pattern right some grain pattern and the, the grain pattern is going to impact the properties of the wood right if you load this wood in tension along the grain it's going to act differently than if you load it you know in tension perpendicular to the grain does that make sense in, in when you're pulling it you know in perpendicular to the grain you're kind of pulling those those grains apart versus when you're pulling it in tension you know parallel to the grain you're you're pulling on the wood fibers themselves so rather than the bond between the the grain you're pulling on the wood fibers themselves so so wood behaves differently depending on how you load it right so and typically wood is has you know three different types of loading right so i mean you could load it uh, like this, like this, or if I can draw this, can I draw this? Maybe. Um, you know, you could have a, a loading like this that would be even different. What do you notice about each of these? You notice, maybe you don't, but if we look at this, this is sort of like a coordinate system, an orthogonal coordinate system. You remember that ortho word? Orthogonal. Uh, orthogonal is like right angle coordinate system. So orthotropic means you have essentially different properties in orthogonal directions. Does that make sense? So wood is a perfectly a perfect example of an orthotropic material because it has different uh, different properties in different directions. Whereas this this root iso uh, means kind of like the same, right? So with like a steel, for example, if if we have a piece of steel here, so if if you know if this is wood. And then if I have a piece of steel, the steel doesn't really care, you know, which way I load this steel. Uh, it's still going to have, it's still going to have the same yield strength, right? It's still going to have, uh, you know, it's still going to kind of behave. The, the steel acts the same no matter which way I load it. So steel is more of an isotropic material whereas wood is more or orthotropic and you, if you think it, ortho I spelled it wrong um, orthotropic okay so again I, I, I threw this one in there not because I expect you to maybe even know what these words are oops um, ortho versus isotropic but I threw them in there to kind of get you thinking a little bit about the idea that wood behaves differently depending on which way you pull it okay that's, that's a unique thing with wood compared to uh, steel. So it, specifically because the FE says and wood, I'm throwing this in there. Uh, and then if we come down here and we look at this, this the last question we have here is from the following list, select the properties and characteristics that have an impact on the design tensile strength of sawn lumber. And again, maybe you never took a wood design course, but I wanted to throw this one in there because I think I, I just wanted to get you thinking a little bit about this. I also threw a reference standard in here. So if I, uh, if I, hold on, um, if I go to that link here, let's see if I can go to it. Uh, is it going to let me? Yeah, sure. Why not? Oh, wow. Let's go. Let's go there and see what happens. If I go to that link, uh, this is going to give me um, an AWC American Wood Council design standard. So this is kind of cool. This is a, a, a design standard um, that is is free. It's publicly available. Um, if you want to purchase a, an actual PDF, you can go purchase it. Um, if you want to purchase a hardcover, you can purchase the hardcover. There is a free view only option kind of for things like this if you want to check a few things out. I'm going to go to Sound Lumber and uh, take a look. So, if I come down here for a second and come down to our design values, I kind of like this table here. This table just says a lot, and it's it, the the resolution on the free version isn't that great. It's because they, you know, you need to if you want great resolution, go buy it. Um, but at least this is this will at least kind of get us to the point here where we say that 
Uh, the bending strength, the tensile strength, the shear strength, the compression strength, the compression perpendicular to the grain, and the modulus elasticity. Again, you, you have different compressive strengths depending on if it's parallel to the grain, perpendicular to the grain. But there's a lot of modification factors in wood. There are different factors that modify the strength of wood. And this is the, this is kind of the last concept that I kind of wanted to throw out there for you, is wood behaves differently depending on a lot of factors. It's not just load and shape kind of like steel is, right? I mean, steel, you have load, length, you know, shape, moment of inertia kind of thing. Wood, you have to deal with the load duration. Is this there for a short time? Is it there for a long time? Is the load there? You have to deal with the wet service factor. Is there a lot of moisture? Is there not a lot of moisture? You have to deal with the temperature. Is it cool? Is it hot? Um, it, you know, obviously, if it's going to catch on fire, that's bad too. You don't want your wood to catch on fire unless you have s'mores and uh, a campfire, but that's a different story. Um, you don't want it to catch on fire in your building, uh, right? And then we have beam stability. Is the beam stable? Are you going to get buckling, uh, lateral torsional buckling? Uh, the size factor, uh, there's different, if a smaller member versus a larger member, there's a, a factor uh, that can impact some of these. Uh, the flat use factor, so if you're, you're bending flat versus bending on an edge, um, those, you're going to get a different factor. Right, the incising factor. If you like bird's mouth this thing or cut into it, it's going to make a difference. A repetitive use. So if you have a bunch of joists lined up in a like a house or something, you're going to get a, another factor. So with with wood, you get all these different factors that impact the strength of it. And I wanted to throw this question in there. Just again, you, you may have never had any any design in wood, but I just wanted to get you think the, thinking a little bit about wood because it has multiple properties that can impact its strength. And specifically, this question asks for which of those properties actually do impact its strength. So if I come in here, and I maybe I can put both of these up at the same time, um, but what do we see? Um, we see if we have tension here, so we've got tension, okay, um, is, you know, the moisture content. The wet service factor is checked for, uh, for, for, for this one here, and that, this is going to go away. But wet service, yes, wet, wet service is checked. Okay, uh, we'll use, we'll, we'll include that one. And let me pull it up again here. I'm going to have to keep coming back to it the way that this is working. Okay, what service? What about rep repetitive use? Repetitive use is over, where is it? I can't even read this so well just because of the way that the, the PDF is. But again, if you want the real one, um, you can purchase it. But for tension, repetitive use does not come into play. It does for bending. Okay, but for, for tension, it does not. Okay, what about temperature? Um, temperature. Where's our temperature? Temperature factor for tension is in there. Um, size, size factor, size factor is in there. Okay, and um, let me just let me do temperature and size. And what else? Flat use. Where's our flat use factor? Here's a flat use, no flat use factor. Okay. Um, load duration, load duration is in there as well. So you might be thinking, Matson, wait, 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 wait. Just, just time out for a second. You just took me to a table that's not in the reference handbook. You're absolutely right, I did. I took you to a table that's not in the reference handbook. Not so much that I think they're gonna ask this specific question, but more so I just wanted to get you thinking about wood design in general and the, the, the parameters that could impact your design strength for wood, okay? So I wanted to use this more as a teaching moment, the less as like, hey, I think this question is exactly what's gonna be on the FE, more so as just a, hey, these are some of those things that you gotta to start to think about, especially if you've never done anything with wood design in your life before, okay? So is it a perfect question? No, it's not a perfect question. None of these questions are perfect. Uh, but I think it, it gets you thinking about a lot of the topics that could be on the exam. So, you know, the, the good news is, is is kind of knowing what you know and looking through the different reviews kind of to get an overview of the topics. The second thing, if you don't pass, you know, for some reason, it's just to do more practice problems, right? You have to get real fast at them. You have to get good at them. And I think that's going to be your big strength, knowing what's in that reference handbook, knowing how to use it, kind of have an idea of some of these conceptual things, some of the big picture things. Also, just getting confident in, in doing uh, the questions. And Selena, I mean, I wish you the best for that. I think you can rock this thing, crush it, and send it, and definitely reach out. Let me know. 
uh, when you do pass it. Uh, I, I, I love getting those emails. They, they really brighten my day. So, uh, you know, um, this, this past couple of weeks has been a challenge for me. I was hoping to do this session earlier, uh, but unfortunately, uh, actually my, my dad passed away, uh, just unexpectedly. He had a, a heart problem and, and passed away and, it was it was sad there's been some you know uh i've been, been helping my mom out with different things and um had to push this but you know it just reminds me that life is is short you know you get one chance to live it i mean my dad he he went and he never stopped studying he he just kept getting you know studying more and more as he as he got older and uh you know i got to give him a lot of credit for that and uh just in light of 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 of, of ending these sessions with jokes. Uh, the, 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 one of the jokes that I remember my dad telling me from early on, this is an honor of him, um, uh, early on in my life, I mean, we were going on, on car trips and driving around and, um, he was, he was, he, he would always, we, anytime we passed a, a cemetery, he'd look at it and he'd say, Hey, Hey, Mark, Mark, do you, do you know why there's, there's always fences around cemeteries? I'd say, no, why, Dad? And, like, this happened multiple times. I remember him doing this dad joke on me, like, multiple times. Like, says, people are just dying to get in. <sighs> well, Dad, now it's your turn. But, man, I, I, I appreciate you. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess I just wanted to use the opportunity to also say, don't take life for granted. You guys got a lot, of, a lot out there. Um, I, I wish you the best with it. I uh, keep working hard. You know, you guys can go far. You can pass this test, uh, but also just know that you know the test isn't the be all end all. Um, I hope that you live well and uh, you, you do things that um, bring um, love to other people, bring goodness out, out there, and do the good uh, that's been prepared for you to do. I, I I totally believe there's good things for each of you prepared um, in advance to do, and I I think you know I, I hope that you can accomplish those things in your life. So, uh, Fizz, if you, if you look down below, there's a link to a web page. Uh, there's a contact form there. You can definitely reach out to me, uh, through that. I, I get those as well. I've got a couple, I got kind of behind, a, I, I got to respond to a couple of people, but, um, I do, I do respond to that as well. There's a contact form there. So, uh, where you find these, these review problems, there's a link below. You can also find uh, a way to contact me. So that's probably the, the easiest, uh, way to do it. But, Hey, I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate the comments. Definitely let me know how you do on the exam. And uh, I, I wish you the best, right? So, um, hey, until, until next time, guys, uh, keep working hard and keep moving onward and upward.